Uh, good day everyone. Today we'll be discussing about the anatomy of the lower extremity. Again, I'm your professor or lecturer for today, Dr. Orlan Joshua Limboyugan. I'm practicing orthopedic surgeon here in Ilocos Norte. So I divided the, the lecture into the following. First, we'll be discussing about the pelvis and then the hip, the femur, knee, leg, ankle, and finally the foot. I divided each section into osteology, orthology, muscles, and then special topics for each of the following. So first, we'll be discussing about the pelvis. For pelvis osteology, it's composed of two innominate bones, each innominate bone composing of the following, the ischium, ilium, and the pubis. So all of these uh, three structures converge into the acetabulum. And for the ilium, the important landmarks to note would be the iliac crest, which is where we get uh, iliac crest bone grafts, important for uh, orthopedics. We can also palpate anteriorly for the ASIS, for the AIIS, and posteriorly for the PSIS. Uh, the ischium forms actually the posterior column as of the acetabulum, while the pubis uh, composes the anterior pelvic ring. ring. For the acetabulum, it's usually uh, antiverted 15 degrees and then obliquely oriented coronally at 45 degrees. Now, an important thing to note about the femoral head, which is part of the uh, hip anatomy, it, the blood supply of the femoral head uh, differentiates with age. So from birth to four years, the primary blood supply would come from the ligamentum teres as well as the primary medial and lateral circumflex arteries and finally uh, upon reaching adulthood our only blood supply to the femoral head would be the medial femoral circumflex artery so this is important to note because it actually uh, determines the management for some some of our patients for pelvic arthrology the Hip joint stability is primarily based on the bone, which is uh, the ball and socket joint configuration of the hip joint. So we also have a capsule which extends anteriorly towards the intertrochanteric area, but then it only partially extends posteriorly. The most, Im the most important ligament here would be the iliofemoral ligament or the Y ligament of Bigelow, which is considered the strongest ligament of the body. So it's also com the pelvic ring is composed of the SI joint. We have the two sacroiliac joints and anteriorly we have the symphysis pubis. Now for the muscles of the thigh and hip, there are several hip flexors. We have the iliopsoas, which is composed of the iliacus muscle and the psoas muscle. Uh, the, the insertion would be common at the lesser trochanter. We have a smaller pectineus muscle, which is inner innervated by the femoral and obturator nerve. And we have the sartorius and uh, rectus femoris, the sartorius originating from the asses, inserting into the medial tibia. So it crosses two hip, two joints. And we also have the rectus femoris, again, crossing two joints uh, from the asses towards the patella. Next, we have the hip extensors. We have three, the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus, and the semimembranosus. So again, uh, the insert, you have different insertions. The biceps femoris inserts into the fibula. The semitendinosus, which uh, looks like a tendon, inserts into the anterior tibia. While the semimembranosus uh, which looks like which is flat shaped compared to the semitendinosus inserts into the posterior structures of the tibia. Uh, the hip abductors are composed of the following the gluteus medius, uh, gluteus minimus, and the tensor fascia lata. So the primary hip abductor is still the gluteus medius, assisted by the gluteus minimus. While that Tensor fascia lata actually inserts into the ITB. So for the hip external rotators, the more superficial one would be the gluteus maximus, 
Well, the short external rotators are composed of the following. We have the obturator internus, the superior gemellus, the inferior gemellus, and the quadratus femoris. So, the important thing to note about the piriformis is that it's used as a landmark for the sciatic nerve. So, usually the sciatic nerve uh, crosses inferiorly uh, of the crosses inferior inferior to the piriformis muscle. Now for the hip adductors, we have the following the adductor longus, adductor brevis, and adductor magnus, as well as the smallest one which would be the gracilis. For the structures in the femoral triangle, from lateral to medial, the mnemonic that we use is usually the what we term as navel. So we have the femoral nerve followed by the femoral artery, the femoral vein, and then an empty space. And then lastly, on the more uh, medial side, we have the lymphatic vessels. So the femoral triangle is bordered by the following, the sartorius on the lateral, the pectineus on the medial and the inguinal ligament on the superior aspect. For the floor from lateral to medial, it's composed of the iliacus, the psoas, pectineus, and then we have the adductor longus. Now following that, we have knee astrology. So the knee is actually composed of three structures, uh, the, the distal femur, proximal tibia, and the proximal fibula. So all of these uh, compose the knee as well as the patella. So for the distal femur, it's composed of the lateral and medial condyle. For the proximal tibia, if you could note the structure of the proximal tibia, the medial facet is oval compared to the lateral facet which is uh, usually circular in shape. So proximally, it's um, triangular in cross section, tapering into a narrower middle and distal and finally ending into uh, the tibial plafond. For the proximal fibula, it's important because along along its back, uh, you would also usually see the common peroneal nerve winding around the proximal fibula, fibula or the fibular neck into the posterior aspect. And then we have also uh, the patella, which is the largest sesamoid bone of the body with three functions during knee, knee extension. We have one, it serves as a fulcrum. It also serves as nutrition of the knee joint and obviously for protection of the knee joint. For the arthrology of the knee, uh, the capsule extends up to 1.5 centimeters distal to the joint line. So when we're placing pins in the knee, we try to avoid these because it's actually very painful. Uh, and then we also have the meniscus. Uh, the meniscal structures uh, have um, zones so the, we have the red zone which is vascular and can be repaired and we have the inner two-thirds which is nourished by the synovial fluid called the white zone which has a limited, limited healing capacity so usually the medial meniscus is injured three times more likely compared to the lateral because of the structure between the two as you can see the medial side is more oblique compared to the more circular lateral lateral side next structure would be the acl which is usually tight in flexion especially the anterior medial bundle it has a posterior lateral bundle which is uh, tight in extension and then we have the pcl which uh, which has exactly the opposite uh, we have the anterolateral bundle which is tight in flexion and the posterior medial bundle which is uh, tight in extension. I'm sorry for that. We also have the PLC uh, composed of the popliteus, the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, the fibular collateral and popliteofibular capsule and usually uh, when, when this structure is torn the knee is unstable at 90 degrees. So the mnemonic that we use for the ACL would be ample or anterior medial, uh, posterior lateral, tight in extension. 
Now we're going to discuss about the muscles of the leg. So we divide these muscles into compartments, not function. So we have, uh, uh, in order to generalize these uh, muscles or muscle compartments, try to remember that the anterior and lateral compartments are supplied by the common peroneal nerve, while the posterior compartments are supplied by the tibial nerve and can contain preaxial muscles. So we have two posterior compartments, the, super, the superficial posterior and the deep posterior compartments. So these are actually the compartments of the leg. So on the anterior compartments composed by tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus and extensor digitorum longus. And lastly, we also have a bit of the peroneus tertius. So it has the following functions. As you can see, um, the tibialis anterior because it's on the more medial side uh, it also acts on foot inversion comparing that to the peroneus tertius because uh, as you uh, from the name itself peroneus uh, from the peroneal area um, its its function is mainly on foot aversion now for the lateral side or the lateral compartment, we have peroneus longus and the peroneus brevis. Again, their primary function would be foot aversion, uh, but for the peroneus longus, it also has the function of plantar flexion and abduction of the foot. Now for the superficial posterior and the deep posterior. So uh, for the superficial posterior, it's actually palpable, the gastrocnemius. Uh, muscle acts uh, on the foot for plantar flexion of the foot. Uh, it's also accompanied by the soleus muscle which also acts for plantar flexion. For the deep posterior, we have the flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum longus, popliteus on the more uh, proximal area of the deep posterior compartment, and of course uh, the tibialis posterior. All of, com commonly all of these muscles act for plantar flexion, but the flexor hallucis longus of course acts for flexion of the big toe. While the other structures like the, for example the popliteus also acts in, in the internal rotation of the knee. Uh, for the popliteal structures, here are the following. From medial to lateral, the mnemonic is AVN. So we usually see the artery first and then in the middle we have the vein and then uh, finally the tibial nerve. Usually the popliteal vein is more superficial to the artery. Next we have the astrology of the ankle and foot. For the ankle it's composed of both the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. The medial malleolus from the distal tibial plafond and the lateral malleolus from the distal aspect of the fibula. Now the foot is uh, subdivided into three. We have the hind foot composed of the talus and the calcaneus. We have the midfoot composing of the navicular, cuboid, and cuneiforms. And the forefoot uh, which is uh, analogous to the metatar metacarpals and phalanges of the hand. Now for the hind foot, we have the talus and calcaneus. Uh, the talus is uh, blood supply is actually tenuous because uh, uh, the primary blood supply is actually retrograde from the tarsal canal or the posterior tibial artery. It's wider anteriorly conferring stability during dorsiflexion. For the calcaneus, it articulates with the talus. Uh, for the cuboid, there's a groove on the plantar aspect uh, for the peroneus longus tendon. The navicular is called navicular because it's boat shaped and the shape of the tarsals create uh, what we call a transverse arch, which is important during loading of the foot. The cuneiforms, the medial of which is the largest of the three, with the intermediate shorter than the other two. And then for the phalanges, like I told you a while ago, it's analogous to the structures of the hand. For the arthrology of the ankle and the foot, 
the tibiofibular syndesmosis is composed of two ligaments, the anterior and posterior, the posterior being the weaker side. And when you have an injury for to the tibiofibular syndesmosis, we usually term this as a high ankle sprain. Now, the ankle joint is composed of several ligaments. Uh, that's composed of the deltoid ligament on the medial side and the ATFL, CFL, and PTFL. The PTFL would be uh, the posterior tibiofibular ligament is the strongest among those on the lateral side. Now, the calcaneo navicular ligament is termed as the spring ligament. Usually, you'd see this in the inferior aspect and it's usually attenuated in patients with a flat foot or with the pes planus deformity. Now, we're going to discuss about the four layers of the foot. Uh, on the left side uh, would be the picture for the first layer and then for the right side would be the picture on, of the second layer. So for the first layer, it's composed of the abductor hallucis longus, the flexor digitorum brevis, and the abductor digiti minimi. For the second layer, we have the flexor hallucis longus, the flexor digitorum longus, the QP and the lumbrical muscles. For the third layer, we have the flexor hallucis brevis and then we also have the flexor digiti minimi brevis. And then for the fourth layer, we have the uh, interossi muscles uh, and the mnemonic that we usually, we usually use would be PADDAB, a plantar, the plantar interossi muscles having the function of adduction while the, do while the dorsal interossi muscles uh, perform abduction of the digits of the foot. So that ends our lecture for anatomy of the lower extremities.